We'll get back into the swing of it. All right, so have you ever asked yourself the following questions? Number one, how many transactions, contacts, appointments do I need to achieve my goal? Most people don't ask that question, just so you know. That's again what's called a KPI in business, key performance indicator. So in business, what businesses do, they try to define the most important metrics that will drive the goal. Typically, what realtors, what we'll do is we'll have a goal like $100,000, okay? But that is not, that's one key performance indicator. That's one KPI. But a performance indicator is what gets you to 100,000? Well, it takes contacts, right? Making contacts to book appointments, appointments to get a contract, contract to get a transaction. Make sense? That's the process, that's your KPIs. What are you worth per hour? I know many of you have done this with me last year, and the year before, but we're gonna define your worth per hour. This just wants to reinforce that message I shared with you guys before about leveraging time. You see, that worth per hour on the app that we're gonna show you is what's defining what you're worth when you're actually doing those prospecting or con when you're dealing with contacts it's about voice to voice belly to belly eye to eye one or the other on, on the phone so when you're doing that primary number one activity you're worth anywhere from a hundred to three hundred dollars an hour and when you see yourself in that level in that in that value that's when you start to look at yourself differently and say really I need to uh, understand well what am I spending my time on right so what are you worth per hour will I have enough money at the end of the year for for my taxes remember my story just because I made more money didn't mean I had more money and that's of course that the the challenge was for me back in the day when I was young and dumb and just young and dumb all right and uh, yeah okay we'll stop there uh, oh my gosh I can get in trouble this stop recording we're gonna have to edit that out uh, how many bank accounts should I have now, you can have more than I'm going to suggest, but I'm going to give you a fundamental strategy on that again. I want to reinforce it for those who have heard this message before. Are you doing it? What's your mantra? We're going to get your brokers to follow up with you too and say, hey, what's your mantra and your money? Oh, mine's 40, 10, 10, 20, 20, or 60, 10, 10, 10, 10. I'll explain that in a moment. All right, how much money should I put in each account? I want to take total control of your money? How do I get peace of mind when making expenditure decisions? Now, I'm going to share something with you guys because I wasn't Remax at the beginning. And I know this predominantly Remax audience. So I was working for a company called Family Trust. They had about 1,600 agents and in, this, in 30 offices in the province of Ontario. That's the equivalent to a state, okay? Like Missouri. So we had 16 office, uh, 30 offices, 1,600 agents. And uh, one of the things that I did, in, uh, where I found in my business was. Um, I would do agent to agent referrals. So like we did an annual baseball tournament, an annual um, Christmas party where they did the awards and stuff like that. And just by virtue of surrounding myself with people in those two environments, they would all get together in one spot. I would do maybe six or seven deals a year from people who knew what town I lived in. They liked my energy, they liked who I was. They would send me referrals and vice versa. So um, here was the cool thing. That was the extent of my experience going to a Christmas party Party and the baseball tournament every year but back in 2002 when I was first invited to come to a Remax event I was a broker owner at 60 sales associates at that time nobody ever and I say this to brokers all the time why didn't you call me and I'll explain this in a moment so now I'm a broker I get uh, I had a franchise salesperson from Remax called me up says Peter just wanted to let you know a little bit about what your competition is doing you want to get together I said I love it I'm an easygoing guy that's how easy it would have been to book an appointment with me by the way oh you going to buy me a beer what time <laughs> right there I'm Canadian that's all we do we drink beer and we play hockey yeah. that's it very very simple life so anyways um, this franchise development director calls me up he and as as he furthered the relationship together right he said to me Peter you know what I'd like to do is says, what's that I'd like to fly you to Florida I said wait wait what what do you mean fly me to Florida yeah I'm gonna put you up in a hotel I'm gonna pay for your flight I want you to come to the R4 convention and in that in 2002 was Orlando Florida I'm going what's that they said it's this and that and there's a thing called so many minutes with David Lineker and blah 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 I want you to experience it so let me see if I get this straight 
You're going to put me on an airplane. You're going to pay for the flight. You're going to put me up in a hotel for four or five days. You're even going to take me to Disney World, which he did. And, uh, and, and just so I, okay, I'm in. I'm in. So I went down to the conference and I checked it out. Phenomenal. 6,000 agents. I mean, that's four times the number of agents in the entire company I worked for, all in this environment. And these are the movers and the shakers of the industry because to spend three or four thousand dollars to go to a conference, an event, the ticket, the flight, hotel, whatever it would cost, means that they're doing business. You're surrounding yourself with the Eagles, going to all these different conferences or different speaking engagements, listening to speakers. Then I go to the market center. And at the market center, they got all the suppliers there, all the vendors, right? And, uh, and, and, and I was thinking to myself, I never knew you could get that kind of marketing material or you can get that and those kind of tools and t-shirts and key rings and this and that because of the company I was with, they didn't have that stuff. And if I was going to look for something, I'd have to find it on my own. Now here's the, here was the real, this is what pushed me over the edge. There were agents there set up with a booth, right? Set up with a booth saying, hey, if you're going to buy in, Kansas City, Missouri, think of me. They got pictures, you know, whatever it was, right? And they would, they would um, have pamphlets about their marketplace. And, and if people were, had clients that maybe were moving into Missouri, they would probably think about using that agent. When I saw that, that's where the light turned on and said, holy crap. I would have been that guy if I had a Remax broker would have called me would have shared with me their value proposition that they're bigger than their just their office that I could have gone to an event called like Las Vegas which they go to now and you could be plugged into this and you could leverage that to make more money you realize as a coach I go to those conferences every year and uh, I'll have my business cards in my pocket. I'll be at a bar having a drink. And somebody will say, hey, where are you from? I say, oh, I'm from Toronto. I say, really? I got somebody who's moving to Toronto. Here's my card. Where's your card? And I'm going, I'm like, guys, I, don't, I haven't sold a house 20 years. I'm saying, even without trying, if you're social enough, you can make money. Okay? Now, my point is, holy crap. Like, I, if I wish I could have doubled my volume, I was already doing a lot. But I saw this as an opportunity now to develop agent-to-agent -agent referrals. I'll give you another example. Oh, I'm glad I brought this. This guy, Gorin, he put this, this book together. He manages a whole bunch of teams. He's got one group called CCR Group, Cross Canada Referrals. He got everybody's picture in here of all the different marketplaces. That's how they coordinate together. You want to be around that energy? Who wants to put that in their business plan? Now, you might say, 2020, I can't do it. I can't afford it. And maybe some of you might even be making six figures and still can't afford it. Why? Because you didn't budget for it because it wasn't part of your plan. And I'm not just using this as an idea. I don't care if you go or not. For me, this was this really sung to me. And you know what? I've got to tell you how committed I was to this. I might have to edit this video if I'm going to broadcast this to all my clients. But that's the reason I converted to Remax. I went back and covered my office immediately and the only thing that screwed me up was I still had four years left on my franchise agreement with the brand that I was with and I wasn't allowed to so I ended up selling my company. That's how committed I was and that's how much I believed in it. So I tell you guys, you, you're in the best brand. This is a phenomenal brand and just being able to leverage this is kick butt. All right. So bottom line is this. If you didn't have the budget for making those kind of expenditures, says you're going to stay in your little bubble, you're in your little marketplace. Oh, you know the, oh, you know business is boring or it sucks or oh the market is down. Oh my gosh, you got to you got to leverage and tie into that stuff. Is it going to be in your plan for 2020? I don't know. How about 2021? And I'm just using that as an example of what I'm talking about. You need to know how do I get that peace of mind. Because if you put all that money in one bucket called a checking account, guess who else sees that money? Your spouse, your partner. And if they don't understand that you need money to run your business, to make money, to spend money to make money, then guess what happens? And here's what happens with you guys. I'm telling you just from my own experience, you make your money in the spring, you collect it in the summer, you spend it in the fall, and you're broke in the winter. Right? Because that's called market rhythm. You make your sales like this, and you collect your money like this. You're not an employee. You're not getting a salary. You're not getting deductions at source. You're not the same. You're a business person. If you don't work it like a business person, you're going to mess up. All right?
How do I, should I reinvest back in my business? I bet you if I'd ask a question, and I hope the ones that have heard me speak before might have an answer, but if you don't, get to figure it out. How much of you, the money that you get net from the broker, how much are you putting into the bucket to reinvest back in your business? Do you even have a percentage? Do you actually manage it? Do you know how much it is? Do you know what it's gonna cost you to run your business next year? Most of you, the answer is no. All right. Do you have to pay board dues to have this facility? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, okay, that's a business expense, right? Do you have to buy cards, lock boxes? Yes. Do you buy marketing, flyers, do put in ads? How much do you spend a year, do you know? You gotta know your numbers, you gotta be on top of it. I don't care if you don't like numbers. We don't like numbers. <laughs> I don't care. Figure it out. Get to know numbers, okay? Because then you're always going to hit a ceiling. If that's your attitude with that, that's your attitude with life. Oh, that's just the way I am. Well, that's just great. You know, or I don't like numbers. Well, fine. Then just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for that. That's good for the audio. <laughs> right? So you see what I get. Guys, I wasn't the numbers guy either. I built a whole business on it now. I'm the living proof that don't use that as an excuse. It can really change. It will change your life. Remember I told you a story about the three brand new cars? Didn't have kids. Holy cow, only three years ago did I buy a brand new car. I was driving a 2004 Dodge Durango up until then. And you know why? Because it got me from A to B. And it was paid for, and I didn't, and here's the difference. I chose a number of years ago already to pay cash for everything I buy. I don't care, if I go on vacation, if it's 10 grand, I better have the 10 grand, I'm not going. If I gotta buy a car, I need that money. And it's, and guys, I'm not telling you how to mitigate your taxes because this ain't an accounting course, okay? I get it. You got your write-offs, all that stuff. Don't, don't listen with those ears. Listen from the ears of how do you actually take control of your life and how do you spend less is when you pay cash for shit, okay? And I tell you something. So I walked into that dealership. I still remember to this day, and I like American muscle, right? So I went to a Chrysler dealership. I was like, oh, nice Challenger, Charger. And then I saw, but I needed SUV. I, I need that because I have a, a boat to pull and some other stuff. So the thing is, I was looking at the Grand Cherokee. And in Canada, we have the privilege of paying a lot more for everything. Like for instance, oh, I'll tell you a really great story. When I was in Texas, I actually rented a Dodge Challenger with the Hemi. I was having fun with that and I, I, I ran out that gas tank. And when I was pulling into the rental car agency just before I filled up the gas tank, and, and because I have a Canadian credit card, I can't buy gas because I have to pre-buy because I don't have a zip code. So I went into the, into the, uh, the kiosk and, she, and I said, oh, give me 80 bucks on my credit card. She goes, for what? It says for gas I got to fill up I, for, like you're the gas person attendant like why are you asking me that question it says it says darling I'm from Texas darling you don't need no eighty dollars I go what do you mean I don't need eighty dollars I got an empty tank it's got to be about 70 liters he goes you don't need no eighty dollars I got an SUV I got a suburban you're only gonna need like thirty dollars I go like, no way you're gonna need thirty dollars <laughs> no way so I said okay give me fifty filled up the tank 30 bucks I was like holy cow you guys got it made we spend it's cost us more than four dollars a gallon for gasoline you know when I bought when I looked at that Grand Cherokee it was eighty seventy seven thousand dollars but wait there's more we have the privilege to, to pay 13 percent HST that means harmonized sales tax 13 percent tack that onto seventy seven thousand and tell me what that number is close to ninety thousand dollars right and but we have free health care. So, um, <laughs> you catch my, you got, you got my draft. All right, nothing's free. For anybody who listens to what's happening on TV right now, oh, we'll give you free this and free that and free that. And free. Yeah, okay, then you got $4 a gallon too, and you guys could also pay the taxes we do and knock yourself out. Go that route if you want. I mean, we're surviving, barely. <laughs> Anyways, enough about politics. Okay, so now I'm thinking 90,000 bucks. I'm going to peel 90 grand out of my accounts to buy a vehicle. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But I could do $450 a month on a lease. But it's not the way I look at things. I look at what is it going to cost me out of my pocket. I looked around that dealership. And I said, ah, I like that orange. What? That orange Jeep. How much is that? It goes 36.5. I'll take it. 
see the difference? If you think differently, you act differently, and the problem is when you become too aloof with that credit card and everything else, you just spend randomly, oh, I can afford 300 a month, I can afford 500 for this a month, I can do this a month, oh, it's only gonna be this much extra, right? <coughs> when you think in terms of paying stuff for cash, you got a different attitude. That's the way I choose to live my life now, and it's fan-freaking-tastic because I don't overspend. So yeah, I could afford those three co new cars today better than I did when I was in my 20s. Better, but I have one car now and it's a $36,000 Jeep and it's three years old now, okay? That's my messaging. You can see the theme happening here. Do you see, do you follow my theme in this process? Okay, how do I generate an extra 50, 100 grand? Who doesn't want to do that? Put up your hand if you want to earn an extra 50, 100 grand. Yeah, everybody in this room, fantastic. So I'm gonna show you how, in fact, many of you already got the potential, you're just not leveraging it yet. And we'll talk about that at the end after lunch. So if you don't know the answers, I'm gonna give you some of the answers, all right? You ready for this? So let's now, first of all, talk about the boring part, taking care of how to handle your money, okay? Let's talk about how to handle the money. It's simple. It's don't have to have a, an accounting degree. You don't have to have, uh, don't have to be a CPA. I actually have accountants and people with MBAs come up to me sometimes after presentations when I do, especially for brokers. And they go, how did you figure that out? I said, you know what? Funny thing is, it was just common sense. Tweaked it, I comp and I showed it to some smart people that said, that works. All I did was just kind of created the parallel across. So guys, this is how simple it is. Step one, there's four keys, okay, to managing money. There's only four keys, and again, everybody in this room can do this. It's a piece of cake. First key, set up at least five accounts, all right? Now, if some of you are ultra green, spreadsheet people, can manage everything on a piece of paper like that, Knock yourself out. Do what you do best. But I'm telling you, for the majority of the room, this is a simple strategy. Five accounts. Why? Because there's five areas of your life you need to fund. Five areas of your life you need to fund. You have your personal side. Your personal living is what? Your needs. I have to pay the mortgage. I have to pay my health insurance. I have to pay my car. By the way, guys, I know you're probably going to say, well, shouldn't that car be in the business bucket? For taxes, yes, all right? But this is why you get confused. You're so consumed about how to save money on taxes, you're blowing your brains out in your money, all right? And with credit cards too. Everybody's so concerned about points, putting, jamming everything on points, you lose total control of what's personal and what's business. Why? So you can get more air miles? Seriously, think about stop playing the game and stop being controlled and manipulated by the people who are a lot smarter, smarter than all of us in this room and only want one thing, to get money from you, interest, okay? They want you to lose control. They want you to pay those high interest rates. All right, so it's about time we start saying enough is enough, all right? And stop with this, with this logic. Oh, I'm gonna put this because that's a business expense. Let the accountants do that. Remember what we talked about with leverage? That's why you have a bookkeeper. Hire a bookkeeper. Everybody in this room should have a bookkeeper. Everybody should have an accountant so they can do their tax. Now, if you're making 20, 30 grand a year, I get it. You may not go to the expense, but the bottom line is, that's what I'm talking about. Stop doing, just because you know how to do bookkeeping doesn't mean you should do it, right? It means you got to focus on what's the, the highest and best use for you. So, getting back to this, think like an operator. I tell this to brokers too. They'll blend the personal and the business together. And then when you, I looked at a P&L the other day. It was so confusing because she had so much confused in it. She's an owner of a, of a building. She, she, she manages the office. She's a real estate agent and she's a broker owner. That's four different roles all mushed into one P&L. And then if you ask, say to her, you should know your numbers, she'd be like, uh, I don't know what's going on, okay? So guys, I'm gonna keep, this is a simple strategy. So follow, follow me on this, all right? You have your needs. Anything that you have to pay, every, like a fixed monthly, mortgage, in, uh, utilities, that goes in that bucket, okay? Everybody with me on that? Call it your needs. Number two is your wants. Now, everybody can have different definitions, so you have to just understand my definition of savings is your wants. We all came dressed this morning, right? But do you want new clothes? Yes. That's a want. Okay, a want. Now, what are what are groceries? Which one? 
groceries. Right, groceries. How about going out for dinner? Right, okay, so that's how you look at it. It's not something you have to have, but something you want to have. Who wants to go on vacation in 2020? Yeah. Most of you, okay. What is that? It's a one, right? But here's the worst part. Oh, I got a credit card. We can pay for that, no problem. Guys, I tell you, it's a slippery slope. You'll never get out of that cycle. And, and sometimes I'll even recommend to some of my clients, you should sell that piece of, you know, that house and cut down your expenses. You know why? Because if you get your handle on this, you can buy that house back later and pay, pay cash for it. Or you can, pay, you can afford it a lot better later on. But right now, if you don't get off that hamster wheel, every year is gonna look the same, right? That's what happens in life. People sort of capitulate, oh, that's just the way it is. They don't even think about it. They don't you know, directly think that. It's indirect, right? So, profit account. Okay, needs, wants, Retirement, right? Or, I gotta modify this, I didn't say this last year. Debt repayment, paying those credit cards off because what good is it if you got a 20% credit card or 15% interest on a credit card and you put it into some sort of mutual fund that's getting you 78%. Pay off the stupid debt first. That's the best way to use your profit account initially. And then if you have no debt, then put it into investments. That's my recommendation. Or put it towards an investment property so you can generate residual or passive income, right? That's another cool thing. But a lot of people mismanage investment properties too because they take that extra cash flow and they use it on their lifestyle. And then that's why their, their investment portfolio doesn't grow and expand because that money should stay into its own business account. You with me on that? So I'm not gonna get too deep on all this. Just take some core principles aside. So does that make sense? The profit account is for your retirement and you're not gonna retire that well with a lot of debt. So pay off the debt and then get in investing, okay? for the future. Number four, business operating. What's business operating? Now, this is not the desk fees and the percentage fees off the top, all right? This is for, because I call that a cost of sale. Don't get too overwhelmed with my terminology, but here's what I'm talking about. Signs, cards, membership dues, um, uh, going to R4 convention because you know you're going to make a lot of money and it's going to enhance your business, that kind of stuff. Uh, advertising, marketing, that's your business operating account. Many of you don't invest or spend that money. You know why? Because by the time it comes around where you should maybe buy calendars for your clients, and you've got maybe 500 people on a database, or even worse, 1,000 that you're mismanaging, you're not managing, you're going, oh my gosh, that would cost me a fortune, can't really do it, I'm running out of money, and then you don't do it, and then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And the worst time is, you're right at that stage where you already spent most of the money, because you collected it at June 30th with all the closings, spent it in the fall, and now you're at a business planning conference here in November, where most of us are broke from a cash flow perspective, right? I'm not saying you don't have to agree with me. I'm just saying that's the reality. And wow, what a great time for me to try to promote my business, huh? With a bunch of agents got no money. So, right? So, but bottom line is, you need a business operating account. And by the way, maybe you should put coaching and training in there. Why not? I'd like to have you as a client maybe next year or maybe two years or three years from now. Would you like me to be your coach? Yes, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Oh, ah. yeah. I don't know. He's Canadian. He speaks funny. <laughs> but bottom line is, guys, you see where I'm going with this. That's why you want to think about, well, what should be in that bucket? How much do I need? And what percentage of my net check should go in that bucket? The last one, ugh, taxes. You know, the worst thing that happens to me when I do this presentation, I have somebody always inadvertently in the room says, Peter, I get all of that, but I need 110% in this account. Okay, let me do this again. So Peter, out of the 100%, I need 110% just for this account. So this is the problem, right? We have to realize you got five areas of your life, you got a budget. If you don't see that, and what you measure gets what? Improved, yeah. And, and, and it, so you don't see it, you're not gonna improve it, you're not gonna think about it, because what happens? You're running to the next deal, your kids have gotta go to soccer practice, or, or football, or whatever it is you guys do here. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's not hockey. Um, 
But you know, your life, life gets busy. You need to have some simple strategies and habits in place that just happen automatically without you thinking about it so you can focus on the important things of life, like your family and like your business, right? So realize there's five areas of your life you need to budget, okay? I don't have to go through this. Number two, number two, you gotta have a credit card, I know. I have two credit cards I travel with, one personal and one business, all the time. And by the way, even if I take the little lady out for dinner, I know we could say to ourselves, but I can kind of take our business expense and say it was a client. That's not on tape, I didn't want that on tape. <laughs> I get it, but you know what I do? I still put it on my personal credit card and I put real business on my business credit card. I'll let the bookkeeper and the accountant decide on what parts of this bucket they can shift over here. You with me on that? So stop trying to be accountants. We're not accountants. Just manage your life. And you know how simple it is for bookkeeping? If you say that account's all personal, legitimate personal, and uh, there is some, uh, you know, stuff in there. But you know why you do that? Because then you have clarity. You see what it costs you to live. And on the business side, oh, that's what it costs me on the business side. What you measure gets improved. What you measure gets improved. What you measure gets improved. So, yes, I understand you have credit cards, but let me ask you this question. Which bank account do I pay my, my business credit card out of? Which bank account? Business. Right, account number four, right? Here's my personal credit card. Which, which bank account do I pay my personal credit card out of? Right, yeah, out of the personal, right? And that's the whole point. Um, it, you know where, and even if, here's what's gonna happen. I know it's gonna happen. Sometimes you're gonna have to rob Peter to pay Paul, all right? That means you're gonna, but here's the point. You know that you're doing it. You'll see yourself doing it. You'll have to go on your app and transfer funds over to here. And it makes you think it and see it and experience it and relive your strategy and going, I don't want to do that too often. And if you do, then you know you maybe need to readjust some things. But you see, it happens naturally now, right? That's the point. That's the point. So yeah, you have to have a separate credit card, separate maybe line of credit, but keep them distinct, personal versus business. That's my recommendation. It's going to take some time to get used to that, but I promise you, you just implement a very simple strategy. Five accounts, and the next step, what percentage goes into each bucket, that's all you have to think about. You know what's wonderful? When I talk to people who have listened to this presentation before and they come up to me the next year and they go, you know what, Peter? I, that account strategy just absolutely is awesome. I wanted to spend money on some marketing. I, would, uh, I could look at my bank accounts. There's a balance. And you could see clearly, oh, I got $6,000 in there. I can spend the $2,000 for this marketing piece that I would want to spend it on. You see, but if you put it in your personal account, don't tell me it's going to be easy to pull out that two Gs, especially if you've got a partner at home. You with me? You think maybe you might want to teach them this understanding so that they can actually take control of their business, their life? You know what's cool? I did this presentation in Louisiana last week in New Orleans, and uh, we had people that were serving us food. We had 13 vendors in the room, and I had a lot of them come up to me during the breaks and then during the lunch saying, oh, what was that account again? I just wanted to, I was taking notes, and uh, I wanted to show this to my kids, and blah, 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 and oh, and they took a workbook and said, do you mind have a workbook? I said, absolutely, I'm glad you loved it. And it's funny because it makes me realize it's not just about real estate, it's about everything. How about teaching that to your kids? Teaching them just some of those core principles. But here's what I recommend for realtors. If you have a, a goal, let's say it's 125, and you have a certain cost of sale, that's paying the broker. They gotta get paid too, right? Because how do you think they provide the value and the services they provide you? They gotta get paid. And, I, and honestly, I'm gonna say this out loud, I think they're underpaid, significantly underpaid. But that's a different story, we're not gonna go there. Bottom line is, when you get the net check from the broker, okay, the brokerage, when they get that check, that's where you look at it. It's because most of you are, have percentage fees that come off the top, right? And so that's called the cost of sale. Everybody with me? That's the cost of sale. So just look at it from the terms of when you get the check. That's what I want you to do. Now, if you do pay a fixed monthly fee, right, outside, it's not rolled into the percentage fee, then that goes in the business operating budget, okay? Everybody with me on that? Okay, so you need to know what percentage of every check goes into each bucket. So here's my rec, here's a benchmark. 40, 10, 10, 20, 20. You with me on that? 
40, 10, 10, 20, 20. Next year, I want people to come up. I want to say to them, what's your mantra for financial management? I want you to say 40, 10, 10, 20, 20. Or some of you might be 60, 10, 10, 10, 10. I want you to own that mantra, okay? I want to reinforce it. We're going to put it in the training. I'll give it to your brokers too, so that you just own that, all right? Everybody's life is different. Some of you have partners at home that maybe pay all the operating expenses for the personal side. Maybe, right? Pays the mortgage. Whatever it may be, everybody, you got to customize this to you. Does every, that make sense? Make it customized to you. Now, typically, I use this 40, 10, 10, 20, 20. So every time you get a check, here's what you do. Here's what I want everybody to commit to. I, I hope everybody says yes to this when I ask you. When you get a check, I want you to take the whole amount and put it in here. All of it. All right? And then, once you do that, I want you to divvy it up to the other accounts. Everybody with me so far? You get the check, goes in here. Divvy it up. Even if you know, even, promise me this, even if you know you need that whole check for this. You with me? Get into a discipline. If you have a discipline, you create a habit, you don't have to think about it anymore. That's the point. So guys, this isn't superficial. This is really works on the psychology of human beings. Everybody with me on that? Who's willing to do that? Shout yes. 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 All right, good. That sounds pretty committed. All right? So you're going to put it in here, and then you divvy it up. And, even, and then once you divvy it up, go, okay, I'm going to take some money out of here, or I know some of you are going to have to take this out. And you're going to have to bring it over here, okay? I don't care. I want you to live according to your goal here, all right? And I want you to feel it. I want you to feel the pain. Take the money out of somewhere that you need. You're going to need that money later because you have to do this. I want you to feel it. Because believe it or not, if I'm an effective speaker, effective speakers create pain, right? Because until the pain of staying the same comes greater than the pain of change, you never change. Some of us, here's the problem. A lot of us have pain thresholds way too big, way too long. If I could figure out a strategy on how to shorten the pain threshold for many people, that would be the secret to fundamental success. Do you realize that? Some people struggle with so many different things in their life, but they're willing to go through the pain, not because they're happy, but the change, pain of change is, is more difficult, okay? So I know I speak to a lot of people in a room whenever I speak to them about this because I know the pain. I felt the pain. I know what it's like. Everybody with me on this? It's simple. Just do it. Please, just do it. Like, put it... I want you to make sure it's in your 2020 plan. And I hope your brokers even ask you, your trainers that you have in your office, hey, did you put that in your plan? How are you setting... How are you working your accounts? Did you set up the five bank accounts? Yes or no? What's your mantra? And if you can't say 40, 20... 10, 10, 20, 20, or 60, 10, 10, 10, 10, or whatever it is, that means you're not doing it, okay? So that's, that's my challenge to the trainers in the room, all right? All right, track, monitor, and review. Okay, well, guys, here's the beauty of it. You know what the tracking is? Look at your app and see the balances, okay? If nothing else, you see a balance in your bank account. So everybody with me on that? That's what gives you the freedom. And then when that agent said to me, Peter, I felt great because I knew I could spend that money. And let's say you want to put in your plan about, I want to go to that R4 thing because I want to get really juiced, right? That's a great opportunity. I want to see what, how to leverage my business this way. I want to learn from the best of the best. Then you got to budget that and you got to know how much you're going to need, right? Right? All right. So I'm going to skip by this because we pretty much talked about all these bullet points. Um, I'm not going to necessarily recommend this, but on your app, for those who downloaded the app, we do have a partner discount button here. If you press on it, there's a number of companies that I really like personally. And if you want to investigate them, you just click on, say, QuickBooks here, and it, it, it would uh, do like a free demo or stuff like that. All right? So it's on your app. Um, I'm going to share with you guys about, I think some of you have Bomb Bomb, Kits Marketing. These guys are awesome, by the way. Um, but regardless, we don't make money off of that, just so you know. I only want to put people in there that I feel are awesome in their related field. And so I just want to make it convenient for you that you go in there, click on the, the link, and then it sets up, uh, set up an, uh, an appointment. Okay, everybody cool with that? All right. Okay. So, 
I took a picture of this. This is in my, the, the gym that I work out in. That's Marilyn White. She's a bit of a taskmaster. But the reason I took this picture, or I had this picture taken is because I like this saying. Surround yourself with those who challenge you, push you, and motivate you, right? And, um, and it's important to be around that energy. That's why I like going to those big conferences. I love the energy. It's fantastic. And here's the reality. You know, they say that we are sort of the, the sum total of the five closest people we hang out with. Sometimes we have to look at, well, gosh, you know, is that the group that I need to, I want to be around? Because you're going to be, everybody either drags down or pulls up, right? So just realize that it's about surrounding yourself. And the reason why I believe in coaching and training is because that's what gets me to my goal because I, if I could do it myself, I would have done it already. So if I don't do what she tells me, she takes it into her, her own hands, okay? So the bottom line is it's about surrounding yourself, maybe creating even accountability groups amongst your own agents in your office. I know your brokers want you to have that kind of accountability. They actually want to be implementers of it themselves. So if you're not taking it, you got to take advantage of that. It's so important because you want to take it to the next level then you can call me. No, sorry. <laughs> that was so shameless. That was horrible. That, I'm not proud of myself about that. <laughs> okay, anyways, but you, you guys feeling me, right? But you can do that right amongst yourself so you feel like you can't really make that kind of an investment. Guys, you've got a team around you, surrounding you that care a lot about you. Okay, I, I know these guys. I know what they're, what they're all about and what they care about. All right? So, easy enough. That was it. That was simple. That's your financial strategy. Was that hard? Yes or no? No, it wasn't hard, right? Five accounts, decide right now what percentage goes in each bucket. Feel the pain if you have to shift it around sometimes, but at least you'll, you'll get total control of your business in your life. It changed my life around. It got me to a point where all of a sudden I got, you know what, when you start doing this stuff, you just get more, you get better and better at it. That's what eventually got me to a point where I said, I'm paying cash for everything. Wow, you know, what a cool feeling that is, right? And again, but of course, then somebody will always be in the room. Going, yeah, but you can write that off and blah, blah, blah. I, I know, I know, I get it. I still get a receipt, okay? <laughs> Anyways. Okay, everybody cool so far? Um, lunch is coming up soon, so you want to give me about 15 minutes before lunch? Sound all right? You guys still okay with the energy? The financial thing didn't drag us down too much? All right, all right. Um, I think Julie, where's Julie? I know she said about 1, 12, 45 or so. Yeah, okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get you to open up your workbooks. And what page is that where you have the numbers? 11. 11. Page 11. Open up page 11. We're going to transpose the data into the app after the break, okay? But here's why I want you to do it on the workbook first. Who hasn't done a 2019 plan? Put up your hand. Okay. Yeah, 2019. I know it sounds crazy. Oh, wait a minute. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah 2019. Sorry. Yeah. So for those of you who have already did 2019, you're going to put the numbers in for your 2020, okay? Some of you, like... Um, you, and the, you, had, uh, you just started with the company, so, and I know um, Brian's been tracking some of your stuff, so you're going to do 19, 2019 first. Um, and so anybody else, I want you to uh, do 2019 first, okay? I know we're already in November, okay? And then, but when I'm going through the slide, I want you to, to do both goals at the same time, all right? So I'm going to say, what's your goal in 2019 in GCI? Make it close to what, what your actual is right now, okay? And then, what is it for 2020? Everybody with me on that? Okay. All right, let's do it. So there's eight steps in creating the plan. We're only going to do step two, all right? So um, now on the app, if you do want to follow along on the app, if you've got it downloaded, you, you go to the home screen there where it says business plan, all right? So, and, and don't worry if you haven't got the app downloaded, if there anybody in the room that doesn't have it, we can help you out at the break, okay? at the lunch break. Um, once you click on that button, I want you to go to step two, but realize here's where you either choose 2019 or 2020. It probably defaults to 2019, okay? So the app defaults to the current year. So if you want to do your 2020 plan, click on that top right-hand corner and change it to 2020, okay? Everybody with me? There's always somebody who doesn't do it. I always say, they go, this didn't work. No, you don't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you choose 2020. Don't worry, we can fix it if you screw up, all right? All right, so choose the 2020. And uh, so now I want you to select number two, select goals and benchmarks, okay? 
and I'll go through, a, we'll see how much of this we can get through before lunch, all right? But there's 21 metrics. I'll go fairly quickly. If anybody wants me to just go a little slower, just put up your hand. I'm not gonna, don't, don't, don't feel uh, shy, all right? So we're gonna start off with the first set of metrics. I want you now to think about 2020. How much gross commission income would you like to earn in 2020? Make sure it's a realistic goal, a bit of a stretch, maybe more than last year, maybe a little bit beyond that you think you can do, just a little stretch, okay? Define that goal, because you're gonna need this goal. All right, everybody got their GCI goal in so far? What do you want for 2020, all right? Next, I want you to put in what I think, what you feel is your average sale price. Do not worry if you're not exact. Right? You can always go back and change it later and people that have been working with me for years know what their average sale price is because we're tracking it. But is it, is it 250? Be close. Some of you maybe work with luxury. Maybe you've got a higher average sale price. Some of you primarily first time home buyers, so it might be lower. Use your gut, put in your average sale price. I'm gonna use 300,000. Next, average percentage per end percentage per end two and a half is it two and three quarters do you get three three percent all the time then you could use three but be conservative whenever you do goals and, and benchmarks you want to be conservative all right be conservative nobody's looking at your numbers right now so don't have to be shy put in what you feel is your average percentage brand everybody good so far now, the, the fourth metric is the toughest one to figure out, so I'm gonna make it easy for you. If your goal is 50,000 or below, put in 30% on the next one, okay? If it's 50 to 100, put in 25%. And if it's a hundred, and we'll we'll get you training on how to tighten that up later, okay? And if it's over a hundred, put in about twenty percent. Everybody with me? Here's the thing: I want you to be higher than what it actually is, because here's the worst case scenario: if you hit your goals, you'll just have more money at the end of the year. Is that okay? All right. See, find, when you talk about planning, it's about forecasting, it's about projection, it's not accounting. All right. You'll get tighter on the exact numbers later, but that's accounting. This is operations, big difference. Any questions on that? I want you to just know that. All right, that's the hardest number, okay? All right, and ask me if you're too shy to put up your hand at the break, at the lunch, I'll be happy to help you. Um, any, any teams in the room, by the way? Okay, so for a team, the only difference with a team and let's say an independent realtor is there, you're gonna split up your goal between team member and team, how much of the, total goal the team leader is going to do and how much of the total goal the team member is going to do but a partnership is not a team okay that means if you got two people sharing the same volume 50 50 that's a partnership so with that just do an individual on each okay everybody with me everybody cool all right and the only difference, and I'll help you with the team one later at the lunch break, okay? Because you're gonna probably ask about team leader commission expense. That's, t that's if you have a typical split of 50-50 with the team member, okay? So you might, you might put 50% in there. But I'll, I'll help you with that later. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Guys, we just went through the financial strategy. I want you to, I hope I don't just see 40, 10, 10, 20, 20, the default numbers on the app. I want you to change those numbers to your numbers. They're not mine, they're yours. And by the way, you could always go back in later. You could change it, resave it, okay? So put in your gut right now. Use your gut feel here, all right? This is where you'll get good at it when you go through this, the training process throughout the year and just the accountability stuff, all right? Everybody good so far? Anybody need more time? Okay, good, all right. And notice here, even when I say beginner on my slide here, I'm not talking about a new agent that just started in business. I'm talking about a beginner and get, it, it hasn't, it needs to deal with their financial responsibility. All right, that could be an experienced agent, 20 years in the business, even if it's 92, 2, 2, 2, 2. I know it sounds crazy, and I know you know that you're going to need more than that for taxes, but I need you to be real. All right, just for now, this will get you to feel it later. Okay, that's got to. Oh, by the way. Got to add up to 100%. It's important. Or you'll get an error message. 
And by the way, if, I know there's always people that are ahead of me on this. So if you click the done button, you're going to lose all your data. Do not click the done button on the top right hand corner of the screen. You're going to, when you're done, you're going to click the save button on the bottom of the screen. And for most of you, your keypad will be in the way. So you need to touch somewhere on the black letters here to get rid of your keypad so you can click save on the bottom. Okay, everybody with me? All right. Do not click done. Okay, now we're at next set of metrics. List to sale ratio. You get a listing. Do you always sell it? Sometimes. Isn't there any expiries in this marketplace? Or somebody changes their mind. So even on a high side, I would use like 90% maybe on the high side. But be realistic. Is yours about 90%? Do they always sell? That's the list to sale ratio. Put in your percentage. All right, I default, I think, to, is it 90? Do I default it to 90 or 80? So, but put in your number, right? What do you think is right? Your gut is what's going to tell you the answer. Okay, same with, with buyers. Buyers to sale rate. Now, that is probably going to be a lot lower, okay? I'm talking about how many times you take out buyers. Do they always buy from you all the time? Not change their mind, buy from somebody else ever, right? Okay, so whatever you feel is your number, I want you to put it in here, okay? Everybody good so far? Not losing anyone, right? Okay, here we go. Appointments to secure a listing. Now, be honest. Are you getting every listing appointment you go on? And if you are, then it's telling me you're taking everything and anything. Because you shouldn't be getting everything because sometimes people are going to be unrealistic. They're not ready or whatever it may be. So, but when you have a motivated seller, how are you doing? Are you getting three out of four? Are you getting two out of four? Is it 50%? Is it 25? Be honest. Are you getting one out of four? That's 25%. Because, you know, it's about your goals here. It doesn't mean that's your goal. It means, let's be realistic with, with sending the, the, the metrics here, okay? So, I'm going to use three out of four, which is high. Same thing with appointments. Do you guys do buyer contracts here? Okay, same thing with the buyer contract. Are you able to get them on paper every time you sit down with them and you go through your buyer presentation? Or are you getting about two out of four? That's 50%. Three out of four, 75. One out of four, 25, all right? Contacts to book an appointment. There's no way, it should, I think it should be 10, personally. I default 75, right? No way it's 75. If anybody's, you know why I put that in there? Because then I use that to see if somebody actually changes their numbers, all right? Because there's no way it's 75. By the way, if you're taking 75 contacts to book an appointment, then you've got other problems, which is your social skills or your communication on the phone, right? There's, because the average American moves every five years. So if you do one appointment out of 10 contacts, that's actually pretty good. That's realistic, okay? All right. So hopefully you put a lower number in. Now, how about business from sellers and business from buyers? Um, I'm going to use a 55-45 ratio, but some of you in this room like working with buyers, right? Put up your hand if you like, you love buyers, yeah? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and some of you might be 90% buyers, 10% sellers. It is what it is. Put in your numbers. I'm going to use this as my example, all right? We're almost in the home stretch. You guys okay? Lunchtime, food, compliments of, who's our, who's our, hmm? Sorry? Old Republic Mortgage. I want to give a, sh warranty, sorry, warranty. Because I want to give a shout out to them for helping us out here today, right? So hopefully you have a chit chat with her and see how she can help you with your business. So guys, so we're at number 16. We're in the home stretch. Here's the last set of metrics. Minutes per business conversation. All right, I'm going to use two minutes. I'm straightforward, to the point, get to the, you know, the meat of the test. But for some of you, who are the blues? Put up the blues, put up your hands. 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes for the blues. Two minutes for the greens. Maybe four or five minutes for the oranges. And the golds, they're pretty succinct. Maybe three, four minutes, okay? But bottom line is put in a number. I'm joking around a little bit, but... Hey, there's nothing wrong with, and I'm not, I'm joking around with this, but, you know, some people connect with people in the way of personal interaction. And by the way, what I would recommend and suggest is if you are making calls, 
get have a list of information you want from them like are you friends with them on Facebook and social media uh, what are their kids names what are their birthdays what are the what are, what are their birth dates? How about the anniversary when you sold them the house? <coughs> Guys, these are all great opportunities to do what? Call them and contact them, right? And the reason why most agents don't contact agents or other people, because they don't know what to say, right? And they don't have a plan. They don't have a strategy. We're going to talk about that after lunch, all right? So how many minutes put that in? Prospecting months per year? Hopefully it's not 12. Everybody in this room, I think, put up their hand. We want to go on vacation, right? <coughs> All right, so I'm going to use 10. Now, of course, 10 months yeah, represents 40 weeks. Prospecting days per week, okay, I'm going to stop here for a second. Guys, I'm recommending five days a week. Here's why. What else are you doing? Like, what else is more important than prospecting? I know nothing right because that's what gener now I know you're going on listing appointments I know you're you're you're, you're um, going through you know price reductions and meeting with people but the reality is how many of people in this room actually put in their business plan on their calendar and time blocked when they prospect right <coughs> guys we give more respect to appointments with others than we do for ourselves and the greatest thing we can do is book an appointment with ourselves to prospect and the reason why we're not going to do it is sometimes we'll get there and we're going mm, I'm not sure what to say well that means you don't have a strategy that means you don't have a plan people that don't prospect every day they don't because they don't have a plan I say this to brokers too if they want to recruit and they want to share their message what's your plan what's your strategy how many times are you touching them and how many times are you interacting with them and when you interact with them are you giving them something of value right um, Greg you introduced to me to somebody who's from Reese Nichols where are you right there did Greg invite you personally to come he did right now wasn't it cool he, he, he introduced you or he called you with the intention of giving you something not asking for something he did it in person in person that's why they call him the silver fox right <laughs> right that's personal right and the thing is but if you if all he did was always call you up and say hey it's about time to leave aren't you moving yet when you're gonna come that would be annoying right and it wouldn't be respectful either because it disrespects your decision of where you are where, for the reasons that you're there, whatever they may be. There's a lot of reasons, right? Just like with myself, when I was at Family Trust, I was there because I loved the manager because she taught me the courses. I felt a connection. And then some stranger comes along. It's like dating. I call recruiting like dating. It's like if you call somebody up and you say, hey, let's have sex. <laughs> <laughs> the closing ratio may not work that well. <laughs> But I may take you out for coffee first and then ask for sex. No, no. <laughs> but, but, but recruiting is like dating. It's about a relationship. You're, you're nurturing the relationship with people. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are laughing because I'm just like, you're never sure about an audience. Like, Am I pushing the envelope too much? All right. But isn't that true? And that's a, well, that's a, that was awesome. But here's the thing, and I, and I know Greg and I talk about this all the time, even for yourself. All Greg wants to do is make sure that you're a second choice, right? Because your first choice is where you are right now, right? And that's, that's the whole premise. And it's the same thing with any relationship. If you don't call people with saying, think about buying and selling real estate now in your future, have you? Nothing they're selling yet? Click. <laughs> that's what it seems like. And that's why you don't want to do it because that's what's internalized in your head thinking that's what you're doing. That's not what you should be doing. So, guys, I want you to set a goal for 2020. How many days a week are you going to prospect? I'm, it could be three, could be two, but at least, but nothing else. Put it in the calendar, time block it, and guess what happens if you have an appointment? You got to take the kids to the dentist at 11 o'clock, and that's your time blocking slot. Guess what you do? Shift. All right? But that's the thing, though. If you have an appointment, when you somebody says, I want to look at this house at 11 o'clock, you say, oh, that'd be awesome. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be a little tied up for a bit. Would 12 o'clock also work for you? I just want to make sure. If they say, absolutely not, i got to make 11, fine, then shift it. But the bottom line is, if you time block it, you see it. What you measure gets what? Woo! All right, we're getting it, right? 
time block it, put it in the calendars. I say, I, I prospect five days a week. The only time I don't prospect is when I'm traveling like I'm doing right now, which is 11 months a year. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, that's not true, actually. Um, I'm really busy this last quarter because it's business planning time, right? So guys, um, I still do it to this day. You know why? Because it's a discipline. And it gets me just to reach out to some people and I'm not calling them, hey, you think about coaching yet? Say, hey, man, how's it going? You know, came up with this really cool tool. I was just thinking about you, know, because our last conversation, I want to flip it over to you. Is that cool? Hell yeah, that's awesome. I tell you, it's a beautiful thing when you look at business, not because you have to have business, but because you're building relationships and they give you business because they like who you are, right? They will send you business. And when you're calling these guys here, how about the last time? You know what I would love to have? I haven't sold a house in 20 years, remember? I'm not in real estate anymore. But you know what? My agent who sold me my house three years ago, I haven't heard from her in three years. You know what I would have loved? If she would have called me up and said, hey, Peter, do you realize your house might have gone up a little bit in value over the last couple of years? If you like, I could send you just some emails to you on some comparables of homes that have sold in your neighborhood. What do you think I would have said to that? Hey, that's cool, Lisa. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Appreciate it, right? You didn't ask me if I was thinking of selling. And by the way, here's what I would add to this, even though it's not part of this presentation. Say, Lisa, I would say something like this if I was the agent. I would say, um, I don't know if you know this after you gave them something of value, but I, I could use your help. And most people, if they like what you've done for them, they'll say, really, what can I do for you? Well, would you feel comfortable if you knew somebody was thinking about selling or buying real estate, would you be comfortable in referring them to me? You're asking permission. It's a humble perspective, right? A lot of times your clients don't even realize that you could actually, they could actually help you. But you just assume that they're gonna refer them to business, but you never ask them. So that could be part of the conversation too. That's just another little ditty you can throw into the bucket, all right? All right, going back to this, five days a week, everybody with me? That's what I recommend, but only put in your calendar if you're gonna follow it through, or even if it's three days a week, it's better, even two days, if you put it in and you stick to it, then you can evolve it to three, then four, okay? All right, the last two are just defaults. According to NAR, they say it takes 10 hours to service a motivated seller, and they say it takes 40 hours to service a motivated buyer. What's a motivated seller? Somebody's interested in selling, doing the presentation, getting the listing, putting the sign on the lawn, putting it up on the MLS, negotiating the offers, getting it to completion. 10 hours is what they say. 44 times as long with the buyer, just so you know. That's why when you think about leverage and you think about your time and you think about building your business, see the natural evolution? Got the personal assistant now, takes care of all the paperwork. Now I bring in a buyer agent. Because you know what? Some people out there are better at holding your hands, holding hands and guiding people through than you are even. Possibly. I don't know. I'm just saying. Guys, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you the reality. All right? So everybody done that? Do not press done. Touch somewhere in the black. Get rid of your keypad. Press the save button. Everybody got it? Done? All right. Saved? <laughs> Thank you. Good save. <laughs> and if you screw up, I got lunch to help you, okay? Ah, all right, I'm hungry. Who's hungry? All right, for crying out loud, let's eat, huh? Okay, how's, how's lunch work here?